Well, good morning and happy Easter. I am really delighted to welcome you. I am John Arnold, pastor of First Presbyterian Church, Walnut Ridge, and it is a pleasure to have you worshiping with us today. As we gather for worship, there's just a couple little things that I want to say up front, but I am going to keep announcements very brief today so we can just get right into what we're here for, and that is praising God for the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Uh, in terms of announcements, one thing I want to note, we're going to do something today that we've never had the opportunity to try to do before, and we're going to celebrate a virtual communion, if you will. I will officiate as I would if you were all sitting here in the pews at First Presbyterian Church. Uh, my members, I distributed to their homes some little communion kits, and I just want to mention to you all that received those, uh, you might not notice this if you're not paying attention, there's two flaps actually on the top. The first one is a clear one. You peel the clear one away first, and that will open up and reveal a little wafer on the top. And then you peel a second time to open up the juice, be careful with it, so you got to be kind of slow and careful. Um, if you are not a member and did not receive those elements, we have what we call an open table where all those who believe in, in, in God, in Christ as God's gift to us, you're invited to this table because it's his table. And that said, since I didn't drop stuff by, I would encourage you to pause the video for a moment and... Go get something you can use as elements. Bread if you have it. If you don't have bread, maybe you have some crackers or something like that. And something to drink with it to serve as your elements as we celebrate in this strange time of doing things in strange new ways. Uh, and be with us in heart and spirit, even though we cannot be together in body in terms of the flesh we are still together as the body of christ which is an awesome and amazing wondrous gift of the spirit that we are tethered together in that way so i think that's about all i have for announcements other than to say that if you do not have a family of worship that you normally attend and or you are kind of your church is currently not offering something online you can go to our website which is fpcwalnutridge.org. You can see the last couple of full worship services and a collection of prior sermons. You can also find on our website links to prior activity that we've had in the church or things we are moving online like our yoga class or the Maundy Thursday uh, worship service that we had collectively with three other Presbyterian churches this past week. And I want to thank the pastors of those churches, Emily Hooks, Hook down at Graham Memorial, uh, at Susan Arnold at Wynn, and Matt Bussell at First Presbyterian Jonesboro. Thank you so much for making that possible and the musicians of those various churches. So all of that said, I want to invite us now to begin to kind of let go of whatever may be stressing us out you know, I've gotten this sense as I've talked with people, people are getting kind of weary and frustrated and just have a lot of edge to them right now because uh, there's a lot of ambiguity. We don't know how long this will last. And that's okay because viruses will come and go. But if there's nothing else we understand out of this uh, service today, it's, it's God is in control when it seems like all the world is losing its mind, right? <laughs> if there's nothing else the resurrection teaches us, it's that when all seems lost, God is still in control and can redeem and bring out victory from tragedy. So with that spirit in mind, I'm going to invite you, let's just take a big collective sigh to let go of that stuff. Just a nice deep breath in and then just ah, let go of that. All right, just let go of that, and let's now center our hearts and minds on God, because this is the opportunity for us to give our best to God, because God's always giving us God's very best. So settle into that thought, in the spirit of this worship today, in the joy that Jesus is alive, and because of that, we will live, and live abundantly, and live forever. Ponder that as we enter into our worship listening to a prelude. 
I invite you to pray responsively the call to worship on your screen. Beloved church, behold the victory of our God. Jesus, our Lord, has conquered the grave. Christ is risen. Alleluia. Sin and death shall reign no more. Christ is risen. Alleluia. Let this peace resound with joy. Christ is risen. Alleluia. Thanks be to God. And please join me in singing our opening hymn, Jesus Christ is Risen Today. Because of Christ's death, because of Christ's resurrection, God has opened the gates of righteousness that we may walk in. And we take the first steps of that walk by coming before him and humbly confessing our sins. 
I invite you now to join with me praying responsively a prayer of confession. Lord Jesus, through the power of the Holy Spirit, we have been raised from the waters of baptism to share in your glorious resurrection. Yet we have not lived as Easter people. We are unsure of your promise, confused about your will, and afraid in the face of danger. Like Mary, we weep at the tomb, but do not recognize your presence. Call us by name, risen Lord, that we may know you with confidence. Whenever we are tempted to fear death, give us courage to confess your Easter victory. Whenever we are distracted by petty conflicts, keep our minds on your reconciling love. Whenever we're overwhelmed by the power of evil, reveal again to us your triumph over the destructive powers of oppression. Forgive us our sin and let our lives be a testimony to your salvation through the love of God and by the power of the Holy Spirit. And hear now, God, our silent prayers of confession to you. Amen. Listen, church. God who raised Jesus from the dead has not given us over to death. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Praise be to God and let us sing together the Gloria Patri. I invite you to join me in affirming what we believe using the Apostles' Creed, saying, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He descended, ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let's pause in prayer before we look at God's holy word this morning. Most precious God, you have given us a great gift in giving us a written word that we can hold in our hands, crack open at any time, and receive comfort or conviction to receive wise counsel to get to know you better. Lord, as we draw near to you through listening to, studying your word, we ask that the Holy Spirit would illuminate it for us, that our hearts would be softened to receive it, and that it would take root like a seed ready to grow and bear fruit. And God, also I would pray that my words would be directed by your spirit, that what I say is going to be a fitting description, and not only a fitting description of what is in your word, but also exactly what someone needs to hear today. We thank you for the blessing of this wonderful mystery of the spirit working through your word. In Christ's name, amen. Listen now to God's holy word. We're going to begin first by reading from Jeremiah, the 31st chapter, verses 1 through 6. And I invite you to follow along if you have a Bible open at home. 
at the time, says the Lord, I will be the God of all the families of Israel, and they shall be my people. Thus says the Lord, the people who survived the sword found grace in the wilderness. When Israel sought for rest, the Lord appeared to him from far away. I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, I have continued my faithfulness to you. Again, I will build you, and you shall be built. O virgin Israel, again you shall take your tambourines and go forth in the dance of the merrymakers. Again, you shall plant vineyards on the mountains of Samaria. The planter shall plant and shall, and shall enjoy the fruit. For there shall be a day when sentinels will call in the hill country of Ephraim, Come, let us go up to Zion, to the Lord our God. And we're also reading this morning from the Gospel of John, chapter 20, verses 1 through 18. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They've taken the Lord out of his tomb, and we do not know where they've laid him. Then Peter and the other disciple set out and went toward the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down to look in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb. He saw the linen wrappings lying there and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who reached the tomb first also went in, and he saw and believed, for as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. As she wept, she went over to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. They said to him, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They've, they've taken my Lord away, and I do not know where they've laid him. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you've laid him, and and I'll take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary? Mary? She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, do not hold on to me because I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Whenever I read this passage from John, this version of the story, I'm very drawn into Mary's part of the story for some reason. Uh, There's that strange moment where She doesn't know what to think. She can't recognize Jesus. I think she's so lost in her grief and fears and confusion that she just, she just is like in a bubble. And if you've ever been in grief, you've probably had that experience where it's almost like all of your senses get dumbed down. And I want to focus mostly on that experience of Mary. I'll lightly touch on the disciples being there because whenever I look at this story, I'm, I'm reminded of a funeral that I did many, many, many years ago. 
it's probably, it's got to be close to 20 years ago, I would say. Well, it's been over 20 years ago. I lived in Logansport, Indiana. And occasionally in that small town where I was an associate pastor, we would get calls from the funeral home to do a funeral for a family who did not have a pastor. That was not at all uncommon. It particularly wasn't uncommon for them to call our church because there were three pastors there. There was the head of staff, and myself and my wife were co-associates. And so we were kind of on their short list to call. It didn't hurt that we literally were right across the street from one of the funeral homes. And in this particular situation, there was a family who I visited with them, and I met with them. And normally when I meet with a family, I take some time and I get to know the, uh, I get to know the loved one hit who they have lost through them. Uh, they'll tell me stories, they'll share favorite memories, and, and we'll spend a long time doing that. And I'm really trying to listen deeply and closely to identify what are some really central themes to who that person is. And then a portion of our time is spent thinking through how we are going to celebrate that life and that resurrection to eternal life of their loved one. And usually that means walking through, you know, what kind of hymns they may want for a service. Uh, It might mean talking through what readings or family members they want involved in the service, Um, or maybe it's also talking through the order of things that are going to happen. There's going to be a visitation and uh, a service and then possibly a luncheon afterwards and then a gravesite, and we work all those logistics out. But in the case of this family, almost none of that happened. I met with them. It was a very small family. Their mother who had died was very old, and most of her friends and family had preceded her in death. So this was going to be literally just a a handful of people, maybe six or eight people, gathering to remember this woman's life and celebrate her resurrection. And they were adamant that the only thing they wanted was a very short graveside service. They did not want a visitation. They did not want a memorial service of any kind. And they only wanted a graveside service. And they wanted that. The reason they wanted that is because that's what their mom had been adamant about with them. When I am gone, please, I just want you to have a graveside and I want you to say a few words about prayer because she really believed in the power of prayer, and to leave it at that. And, and, you know, I do everything I can to just honor the wishes of families in as much as I can. I try to encourage families to maybe do more than that, they can, more than that if they are able. It's not always possible because we need time to grieve, right? And, but in this situation, they, that's, they were very clear. That's what they wanted and all that they wanted. So I honored that. Now, when this funeral happened, it was in the absolute dead of winter. And up in Indiana, okay, this is kind of north central Indiana, the dead of winter is bitter and biting and awful. And the particular morning that we were going to have this graveside, it was that kind of morning. It was, it was that really, really intense cold to where your breath almost crystallizes as it comes out of your mouth. It hurts to breathe when you walk outside. And no matter how much you're bundled, it just seems to penetrate everything through the marrow of your bones. And so we showed up at the graveside and they were actually going to, we were going to have this ceremony where she would be interred, but we weren't going to do it because the ground was frozen solid. We were just going to gather at that memorial spot, if you will, and have the service. Uh, And so we're we're standing there around what is gonna be her grave and there's uh, a headstone there. 
And I, I'm going to interrupt what the story for just a moment and just start to comment a little bit why it reminds me so much of this passage. Because I think for Mary and for the disciples, so many of the ordinary things of what they would go through to grieve losing Jesus got truncated. Not, not by their choice, though, not because they were trying to honor Jesus' wishes or anything like that, but all of the norms of preparing his body and those kinds of things. If you remember, the women came back, and they came later wanting to prepare his body because there had been no time because of the Sabbath and getting his body down and getting it in a tomb as rapidly as they could. And because it was a crucifixion, there were so many things that were out of the norm. In the, in the ways they would have honored the passing of a life were not there. And so, you know, in a modern equivalent, kind of a baseline of what's fairly normative, though it's changing a lot now, is, you know, some time to visit, some kind of service, maybe a lunch with a family in a graveside. That's been historically sort of a norm for us. And so imagine that all of that's gone, and you wind up with something kind of like I walked into where the opportunity to grieve is just, it's whittled down to the most bare minimum. And in the case of Jesus' death, you add on top of that the horror of what happened to him. It's, it's not like all these things happened and Jesus had died because something broke with his health or Jesus had died because there had been some terrible accident where he had gotten injured and couldn't recover it no he was heinously executed in a, one of the most vile and most uh, excruciating ways that you could take somebody's life and it was done publicly and it was done intentionally to humiliate him as much as possible and so they have the weight of that and again probably Jesus, if he had died in any other situation, there would have been thousands of people, right, to show up. I mean, Jesus, a week earlier, was a celebrity. He was coming into Jerusalem. He was being hailed as a king. And we're told last week that the whole city was in turmoil. The ground was shaking almost. I, I say that because it says the whole city was in turmoil. The word, as I explained last week in a sermon, that word for turmoil is the same word used with earthquake. It's actually the word we get seismic from in seismology. Uh, it was trembling. It was qu the whole city was quaking because of Jesus' presence coming in. And there were people hailing him as kings, king, and others were saying, who is this man? But everybody was aware of him, and he had this celebrity status, if you will. And now... We have, what, four people, three people, five people, you know, in his last moments. You have Mary Magdalene and Joseph of Arimathea getting his body. You have a couple disciples showing up, the one that Jesus loved, and Peter, and you have Mary, just a handful of people. No crowds, no celebratory luncheon with family and friends to remember and to reflect and to be with one another and feel the weight of grief. None of that. There's just this isolation. And a lot of it is an isolation caused by fear. And many of the disciples have gone back to the upper room and I imagine they're, they're at a loss as to what to do. They're also probably terribly afraid that what happened to Jesus could happen to them. So who would fault them for keeping their distance? And after literally everyone has trickled away, we have Mary left standing by herself. And I want you to hold that image for a moment, and I want to go back to the story of my family in Indiana. Here's what happened that Sunday morning. Or it wasn't a Sunday, I'm sorry. Here's what happened that morning. I went out there with the family. We crunched through the snow from our car's over to the edge of the grave. I literally just said a few words about prayer, and we had a prayer. It, it was maybe three minutes, maybe five, if you count us kind of milling about 
waiting to feel ready and get started. And we got done, and then there was just this awkwardness of standing there, and you could kind of palpably feel nobody knew what to do. I think that's the kind of space Mary was in. And we stood there, we tried to stand there as long as we could in that, but because it was just excruciatingly cold, what happened is eventually family and the couple friends that were there, again, it was maybe six or eight people, I don't remember specifically how many, they began to trickle to their cars and start them up and sit in their cars because it was just too cold to stand there. And I waited. I wanted to wait until the very last person left. Uh, And I too, though, began to get bitterly cold. So I walked over to my car and I sat down in it and it was running and heating up. But I thought, I'm going to wait here until everybody leaves just just to make sure that people are going to be okay. And everyone peeled away, including myself, except for one person. And there was a son there. And this son, I'm going to call him Alan. Alan was standing there. And he, he stood at his mother's grave. And this is what he did. Let's, let's say her grave's right over here. He stood there. And he was just standing, and you could see the weight of grief on him. He was literally bowed over with the weight of it. And he would kind of take a deep breath, and he would start to walk away a step or two, and he would stop, and, and then he would go back. And, and, and he did this, and he would he'd start over back toward his car a few feet, and then he'd go back. And, he, and each time he was going a little less further back, but it's like he couldn't leave. And I know that part of what was going on was he just still hadn't processed the loss that he'd been through. He was, there had been no time to grieve. There had been no time to tell stories. There had been no time to sing and pray and let some of that weight of grief out through that process. And so Alan was stuck. I think probably a whole lot like Mary, where Mary gets there and she has the added trauma of, it appears that somebody's stolen Jesus' body. And and Peter and the other disciple, they've gone back home. They're a bit like the other people who, they've kind of done what they can do and there's no more they can do. And so they go ahead and they go back for them, the comfort of their cars like the disciples left and went back to the comfort of being in their homes or with the other disciples. But Mary, who must have, I guess, just felt profoundly close to Jesus, she's stuck. And this young man, Alan, I want you to imagine for a moment that on that morning, standing there in the snow, as he's faltering back and forth between wanting to stay and wanting to go and feeling the weight of grief and feeling the bitter biting cold. He's, he's doing this awkward dance back and forth and an older woman comes walking from somewhere out of the graveyard up to him and walks up near him and says, young, young man, why are you so upset? And he's, he says, I, I, I've lost my mother. I've lost my mother. She's gone. I'm never, I'm never going to see her again. And then this older woman who's walked in from who knows where in the graveyard, she says one single word. She says, Alan? And Alan in hearing his name called, realizes that this woman is his mother. And she's alive. And he turns, and 
and the only thing that can come out of his mouth is, Mom? Mom? And he wants to run and take hold of her. And and she kind of holds him off for a moment and says, Yes, it's me. But you can't touch me yet. Not right now. Please go back and let your brothers and sisters know that I'm alive and I'll come see you soon. That's the wonder and mystery of what happened on Easter morning. And I can hardly, I, I actually, I, I don't think I can really wrap my mind around that. Those of you who know me know that just about a year ago, I lost my mother. And I, I cannot for the life of me imagine what it would have been like for her to walk up to me at the cemetery after everybody was gone and find out she's still alive. In fact, it's still... It still stirs my heart and messes with me when I dream about her. I had a dream just the night before last where my mom was alive and I ran into her again and I have these frequently. And oftentimes I wake up and I'm like, and and at first it really threw me back into kind of grieving until a friend of mine said, you know, I just think of that as having a visit. And I realized, yeah, it's it's almost like I get to have another moment with her more importantly I think those moments can be reminders that someday I will be in her presence again that I'll hear her say John and I'll be able to turn and say mom and I'll have a moment like Mary and Jesus and and there's going to be a moment someday where you and, and I and anyone who believes and has faith, they're going to hear Jesus call them by name. You're going to have Jesus call you by your name and know that he's alive. Know that he's alive beyond a shadow of a doubt. Know that this thing that you have trusted and believed in, or maybe you're questioning that. Maybe you don't believe or you don't know what to believe. But there's going to come a moment someday where the reality of the resurrection will become real because we'll be with him again. That is the wonder. That is the miracle. That's the mystery of Easter. And I invite you to just ponder it and let it fill your heart and know that someday you're going to hear your name called and I I believe God's calling our names day in and day out in different ways that God is constantly reaching out to us and there for us right now that this thing about being a part of God's kingdom and kingdom living it's not just in the sweet by and by but he calls us by name to come and join his family. And he makes that possible through the death and the resurrection of his son, Jesus Christ. He takes our sin, which would separate us from him, and it gets nailed to a cross in Jesus Christ. And he dies, not just on our behalf, but in our place, if you will, He takes the pain, the grief, the shame that we should feel for the sin that we have done and he takes it on himself and he deals with it and in so doing, he shatters the chains of sin that would separate us from God and bind us from living in the freedom of the Holy Spirit and living as citizens of this kingdom and we get to live in that forever. Praise be to God for this wondrous mystery on Easter. And would you please pray with me right now and give thanks to God for this great, great gift. Amen and let us pray. Holy God, the resurrection is just incomprehensible. I'm not sure that we can take it in and really wrap our minds. It's more like we can can apprehend it. We can feel a stirring of it in our soul 
and we can just trust and know at some level that it is true. Where we have unbelief, God, give us belief. We thank you for the gift of faith. We thank you for the gift of Jesus Christ who would be willing to die in our place. We thank you, God, for the mystery of being a part of a big family this day that extends around this globe like there are children, brothers and sisters around the entire world who are worshiping and praising you this morning. And we are bound together through one faith, one baptism, one spirit. Lord, we give you praise and glory for that today. I want to pause for a moment, God, and there, there may be things that are heavy on our hearts right now. We may have some, some tombs in our lives right now. We may be standing in a graveyard Someone may be standing in a graveyard right now in that their job recently died because of this COVID virus, and they don't know what they're going to do. Somebody may be standing in a graveyard right now literally because they've lost a loved one recently. Or they're standing in the graveyard of depression or addiction or a broken marriage or the, the pain and the struggle of being a teen about to graduate and seeing it evaporate before you because of things outside of your control. Whatever graveyard someone is standing in today, Lord, we come before you in that space and we listen for you to call our name. We listen to you beckoning to us to reassure us that you're alive, that you're in control, that you have overcome death, whatever it may be, and that jobs will come and go. Relationships sometimes will come and go. Health will sometimes come and go. But you, Lord, stand forever, and that is an eternal truth we can abide in. We thank you for the wonder of this miracle. In Jesus' name, we pray all these things. Amen. Well, friends, normally right now in the service, if you were here in the church, we would have an usher come down and they would have some plates like this and they would go pew to pew and people would uh, bring an offering forward. We obviously can't do that. If you have a home church you've not been able to worship at, I would highly encourage you to send a check to support the ministry that still continues in your physical absence. I've had a number of members, today I went by our mailbox and a number of members have sent gifts in. I want to thank you for doing that today. Um, And if you don't, don't have a church family and today's worship has been a blessing to you, I would encourage you to send a gift here. Um, I'll put our P.O. box at the end. It's P.O. box 214 in Walnut Ridge. I'll just put it beneath me here somewhere in the video. You can pause the video and jot that down. But P.O. box 214 in Walnut Ridge, uh, 72476, I believe is our zip. Um, Let's give thanks for a moment in prayer for God's gifts, both visible and invisible today, and be grateful that we, he gives us enough that at times we can share some of it to touch the lives of people who are going through hard things or to bring the good news like this forward into darkness. So let us pray. Holy God, you do shower us with gifts both seen and unseen. And at times we feel more material prosperity than others. Wherever we are uh, right now, uh, we give you thanks for the gifts you've given us And we pledge ourselves to give back of our time, our talent, of our tithe, uh, to be able to honor you. Just to say thank you for what you've done in our lives and to be a witness uh, and, and to share in the ministry of what you do, God, through this church and other churches. So God, bless the gifts that we give you 
and multiply them, Lord, that they might become amazing ministries touching many, many lives. In Jesus' name, we pray these things. Amen. Let's prepare our hearts to receive communion. Uh, I have a little something special we've inserted in today's service uh, to do so. May it be a blessing to you. Hi, and welcome to, this is our dinner table, which seems an appropriate pro spot to get ready for communion. And I'm gonna play a piece that's all about seeing Jesus. And one of the things that I'm gonna mention as we begin communion is that communion is a time and place for us to be awake to God's presence, if you will. So take a moment as you listen to this to simply be open to experiencing God in communion in a few moments. Uh, this piece is called Alleluia, He is Coming. It's one of my favorite pieces for Lent and Easter. I looked up and I saw my Lord coming I looked up and I saw my Lord coming down the road. Oh, Alleluia, He is coming. Alleluia, He is here. Hallelujah, 
Friends, this is the joyful feast of the people of God. And we are told that people will come from east and west, and they'll come from north and south, and they'll all gather at this great table in Christ's kingdom. What a blessing. Now, it is not the table of the Presbyterian Church. It's not the table of the uh, pastor here, me, or this congregation. It's the Lord's table, and he invites all who believe in him to come and join in this great sacrament. Now at this table, it is a place where our eyes are opened to Christ's presence with us. One of the things that happened after Jesus arose from the dead is that he encountered some of the disciples walking along the road. They didn't recognize him. They were kind of like Mary in the graveyard at first. And for her, she heard her name and that kind of opened her eyes up. But for these disciples, it was when they sat down at a table and he picked up bread and he blessed it and broke it, and in that familiarity, they could see him once again. So this is an opportunity not just to remember what Jesus did once long ago, but it is an opportunity for our eyes to be opened anew to his presence with us right now, and to be reminded that he's made promises that he will come again, and we'll sit at this table with him. So I invite you now to prepare our hearts through prayer using the great prayer of thanksgiving the lord be with you and also with you lift up your hearts we lift them to the lord let us give thanks to the lord our god it is right to give our thanks and praise indeed god we do give you thanks and praise because your love is everlasting we praise you that in the coming of your son, Jesus Christ, your promises that were given by prophets, they were fulfilled and the day of our deliverance has dawned now. As we look for the triumph of his kingdom, we exult with holy joy. How wonderful are your ways, almighty God. We praise you, most holy God, for sending your only son, Jesus, to live among us, full of grace and truth. He made you known to all who received him, Sharing our joy and sorrow, he healed the sick and was a friend of sinners. God obeying you, he took up his cross and died that we might live. We praise you that he overcame death and has risen to rule the world. He is still a friend of sinners and we trust him to overcome every power that can hurt or divide us. And we believe that when he comes in glory, we will celebrate victory with him. Lord, lastly, we pray the words that he taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Remembering the Lord Jesus, we break bread and we drink this cup. And as we do so, we recall his death until he comes again. The Lord Jesus, on the night of his arrest, he took bread and after giving thanks for it, he broke it saying, this is my body broken for you. Do this remembering me. In a similar way, he took up the cup and said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Jesus also said, I am the vine, you are the branches. Cut off from me, you can do nothing. The gifts of God for the people of God. Christ's body broken for you. The cup of salvation, Christ's blood shed for you. Let us pray. 
Gracious God, you have made us one with all your people in heaven and earth. You have fed us with the bread of life, and today you've renewed us for your service. We give ourselves to you and ask that our daily living may be a part of the life of your kingdom. May our love be your love reaching out into the life of the world. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Please join me now in singing our closing hymn, The Day of Resurrection. I charge you to go forth from worship today filled with the joy of knowing that Christ has risen. Christ has risen indeed. Hallelujah. And as you do so, listen for him calling your name. And may you recognize his presence when he does so. Now may the love of God the Father, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you in a very special way now and forever. Amen. And happy Easter.